You guys, if you have a question during this panel, uh, just let me know, kind of raise your hand you know, after the previous person has asked the question. That way I can come walk over to you and kind of make this an orderly fashion. But I do know we have a volunteer for the first question of this panel, so uh, we're going to kick it off. All the pressure's on you. All right, thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, testing, one, two, three. Hi, Professor Klein. So I was reminded in... Um, when you're talking about this, when you're talking about discovery uh, as an important process of the market process, I was reminded of local knowledge and subjective knowledge. Now, whenever I run into an argument about these sorts of things, I run into a semantic issue where people still, when people talk about a big AI machine, a central planner that could co allegedly collect knowledge and collect so-called local knowledge, subjective knowledge, I run an issue where when I say local knowledge, it's not a compelling word. What I'm asking you is, is there a better semantical term um, than local knowledge uh, to show that there's a huge barrier in between central planners and discovery as a feature of the market process? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for asking such a complicated question. You know, I mean, I, I, I think I know where you're going. Let me try to ask it a slightly different way. I mean, you're talking about um, kind of the modern version of the uh, issue that was discussed back in the 1950s. You know, why can't a powerful enough computer just suck up all the relevant data and you know, perf and allocate resources just as well as well as the market. So I mean, have, is there an economic calculation lecture tomorrow? I think. Of, does anybody remember? Okay, yeah. So uh, yeah, no, I, I, I understand what you mean. So, um, the, but that's the general issue: is why can't why can't an AI suck up all the relevant knowledge? Um, is the term local knowledge the right term? I mean, Hayek called it, you know, the, the knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place. So I, I guess I would think of it this way. That kind of, what you're saying is, is there a kind of knowledge that is relevant for entrepreneurs or other decision makers that is hard to encapsulate in data that could then be processed by some kind of an algorithm? And I would say, yes, local knowledge is just one part of that. Right, so what types of knowledge are difficult to parameterize and give to a computer that could then compute the solution to some problem? Well, some of it is like, th there's sort of scientific and technical knowledge, like, um, you know, knowledge of astrophysics, right? So you could go, you could walk down to the Auburn University Library a few, few blocks down, and you could pick up books and articles in cutting edge astrophysics, and you could sit there and process the words. You could read the words, probably most of them, right? Uh, but you wouldn't gain the understanding or the knowledge of the principles that are involved because you're not an astrophysicist. Okay, so, so an AI is not gonna understand the theory of advanced relativity or whatever it is just from being able to process the words. There's also knowledge that is hard to express verbally, even if you have it, like the knowledge of how to ride a bike. Okay, if you know how to ride a bike, you've got that tacit knowledge in your, in your brain about you know, how to shift your weight. It's actually pretty complicated if you think about it, how fast to turn the pedals and how sharply can you turn the, the, the wheel without falling over. Um, you know, imagine that you have, you have a friend who has never ridden a bike before and you're gonna like send them an email or a text message with all the instructions for how to ride a bike. You know, you could try to write that down, step one, stand next to it. Step two, put your feet over the center bar. Step three, turn the pedals. Step four, go. Right, I mean, but nobody can ride a bike that way. So that's knowledge that is in your head that you cannot, even if you wanted to, put it in numbers or words. So the AI is not gonna understand that. Right, and then there's also you know the knowledge that's so minor and uninteresting that it w it's not you know nobody would bother to write it down, right? What what I don't know, I forgot your name again. This guy right here, you know, what did this guy have for breakfast this morning? That's not on the internet anywhere unless you have like celebrity stalkers, right? Because nobody cares. I mean, so that kind of information is not going to be accessible to an AI either. So it's not just local knowledge, meaning 
something in Auburn, Alabama, right? It's different kinds of knowledge that cannot be expressed in numbers or words. Entrepreneurs and other decision makers, you know, they take that into consideration as they act in the market, but a central planner, even with a top of the line AI system, is not going to have all that. That's not really the answer to your question, but that's the thing I wanted to talk about. So I have a question for Professor uh, Rittenhauer. So you mentioned how Mises said that division of labor can kind of like transcend and, and bring about social cohesion. Um, but, you know, one of the biggest problems facing us today is the conflict in culture and differences of people. I mean, you just take somebody who lives here in Auburn, Alabama versus somebody who lives in New York City. They believe in radically different things. And it's hard to imagine, you know, them coming together for division of labor um, and towards, you know, productive, efficient goals. So would you say that the division of labor brings about social cohesion or is a product of social cohesion? I think it it, it can be both. Um, I think that uh, a division of labor, a, for the division of labor to function well, uh, there are certain, certain institutions that are helpful. Um, and the institutions are beyond just sort of legal. I mentioned uh, sound money and private property, but just sort of the, sort of the, the you know, the, uh, what, what should one say, the, the cultural, uh, say, uh, trust, or giving the other person the benefit of the doubt, uh, helps facilitate the exchange that then helps facilitate the market division of labor. If, if, if you're suspicious of everybody, uh, that, that's going to you know, work, that, that may be work against the developing of the, of, the, of the market division of labor. But I think Mises' main point is that once you participate in it, it sort of, it, it, it increases the costs of maintaining conflict and, and, and sort of fosters, um, you know, working in society. But it's, it's not... You know, it, it's not um, it's not absolute. So uh, people will, you know, people make, you know, these are not, you know, people are not merely um, homo economicus. They have all their prejudices and all everything else. But even with their pre prejudices, understanding that exchange, the market division of labor, is beneficial can help subdue certain certain conflicts. But it's not, you know, it's not a, it's a be all and end all. My uh, my oldest daughter works at a uh, lemonade stand near our outlet mall, and she was just making conversation that ended up costing her a tip. Uh, she, the, the people literally were put, put it, putting their money in the tip jar, and they had mentioned that they were from Alabama. And my daughter, goes, my daughter says, oh, yeah, I've, I've been down there. My, my uh, father got his PhD at Auburn. And, and literally... The, the money was like this, and they, in, in the mention of Auburn, she put the she pulled the money out of the jar, and she said, "Well, actually, we're Alabama fans," and put and, and put her money, yeah, and put her money in the pocket. That true story. My and so 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 there's a case where you know exchange didn't foster as much brotherhood as we had hoped. <laughs> uh, hello, I um I had a question regarding the the. Uh, subjective uh, theory of value. Um, when you began your, uh, your talk, you, you described how some uh, take the theory to a sort of an absolute relativism, which got me thinking about what kind of like, objective satisfactions might there be. So, so my question is, what is the marginal utility of truth? First, I have to say that you must have seen a previous version of the lecture on YouTube or something, because I didn't actually say that this time. <laughs> About the relativity point, I didn't make oh, that. You didn't, say, you, had, you didn't use that word, but I, I don't know, you said... No, 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 I said, what I said was the subjectivity of value refers only to the fact that value is a state of mind. Mm -hmm. that, that was the point I was emphasizing. Uh, on, the, on the other question, well... <clears throat> I guess one would say that the marginal utility of truth is the value that uh, a person assesses the, knowing this truth, whatever it is. And different people could certainly have different extents of value that they place upon knowing something that is true. 
it, it would depend upon what the truth was and what their circumstances was, what happened to be, and uh, so on and so forth, right? So we could just take uh, a fact like, um, here we are all together at Mises U. This is true. But the, but the marginal utility that I get from having this truth, knowing this truth, might is personal to me, and it might be different for the way that you assess that fact. Or we might have a more... Uh, well, a less mundane truth that we <laughs> is probably what your question was about, right? About uh, something that's uh, deeply true, uh, that's importantly true for us yeah, in our truth. lives. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so again, it's. I think it's just a. I, I think it falls under. I, I think you're right to suggest that it falls under, uh, for us, the personal valuation that we make of understanding that truth as it as as we incorporate it into our own lives. So if there ever if there was any kind of uh, objectivity in regards to marginal utility, it would have to be uh, something abstract. As soon as it becomes sort of tangible or concrete, then then that's when it uh, it is subjective. Would you agree with that? I'm not sure I followed the. So when I said claim. like the marginal utility of truth, I sort of meant like truth like abstractly, like generally. But then mm -hmm. you sort of described how uh, you related to like uh, like information, uh, like certain facts, like we're all here today and described how that would mean something more to you or to me. But I, but I mean, like, just truth, just in general. Um, that seems to me to be a, an, object, like, an objective uh, sort of desire for all humans, you, uh, you know. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, the, the idea of marginal utility and subjectivity is not a claim about whether or not they're objective elements or whether or not the... the thing that we're personally evaluating it is an objective thing. It, not, not even that it's generally considered as an objective truth. It, it's, our, it's, our own, it's our own individual personal judgment as to the meaning of this to us personally as we perceive it. And so I, I think those two things are consistent with each other, I guess is what I would say. I mean, another way to think think about it. I mean, it's interesting to sort of wrestle with that that kind of the kind of issue that you raised. But remember, I mean, Menger and his followers they developed the concept of marginal utility to explain exchange in the marketplace, right? So when we say the marginal utility of eggs, we mean the utility or usefulness of a marginal egg, a marginal unit of eggs. So the concept of the marginal utility of truth only makes sense if truth is a thing that has units. I mean, what, what is a unit of truth? That's why, I mean, it, it's an interesting point because you often hear non-Austrian economists trying to apply this kind of reasoning to say, well, what about, you know, what about a clean environment? What's the utility of, you know, of environmental protection? Well, I mean, that's really not... That's like a does not compute kind of a question for an Austrian economist because units of environmental protection are not traded in markets. Right now you can trade, uh, you know, a, a, clean, a chemical that cleans or some kind of agent that cleans pollution. Or, you know, there's a machine you can install in a smokestack that purifies the air that comes out. I mean, those are economic goods that can have market utilities attached to Abstractions like truth, justice, the environment, love, world peace are not things that economics deals with directly. Um, thank you guys so much for your talks. Uh, my question is about subjective value as well, so it's a little bit more for Dr. Herbner. Uh, my question is, can you help expand a little bit more on the idea of subjective value and how it can help us better understand uh, desperate situations? I think you mentioned in your talk uh, like a desert situation where someone would be willing to pay a lot more for a bottle of water. A lot of people would see that as a very unfair situation where there's a very unequal exchange of value going on in that. Can you just help expand a little bit more on how uh, a subjective theory of value can better understand those situations? <clears throat> uh, sure. Well, <laughs> I think understand and accept are, might be two different things with someone who holds this view that, uh, you know, there's an unfair advantage that somebody has in exchange. But um, just as economists, of course, we there's no difference uh, conceptually or logically 
between those cases, right? They're not they're not logically distinct. It's just that we have uh, we have uh, two people who have reverse preferences for a good and uh, two goods, and uh, and they make a mutually advantageous trade. The uh, guy in the desert uh, gives up his kingdom for a bottle of water, and uh, because the guy you know has the has the bottle of water and the the dying person has the has the uh, kingdom and and so it's just an exchange right for mutual benefit but the, certainly saying that is not going to it's not gonna, it's not going to aid the you know the economic analysis of it i don't think is is going to be convincing to someone who who objects on other grounds uh that, that the trade is unfair or unjust or or the person really should have out of charity you know given the water or you know, those are all sort of extra economic uh, considerations. Hello. Uh, my question is for, uh, but you can all weigh in, but it's more directed toward uh, Mrs. Dr. Klein. Uh, <laughs> and the question is on money, and I agree that uh, cryptocurrency is not officially accepted as money yet. Right. We may have some differences of opinion on that. Uh, but it's a little bit speculative, but if Rothbard were still with us today, do you think he would be pleased and excited about cryptocurrency or interested in it? Or that, you know, he says a lot about gold. Do you think he would still be a, a hard money gold guy or excited about Bitcoin or things like that? First of all, I'll say, he would say, oh, sweet. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think Murray would be very excited about it, especially just the prospect of having competing currencies. Um, maybe that will be some small limit to inflationary um, policies from, from the Fed. But just, yeah, I think he would be very excited about competing currencies and cryptocurrency in general. I think he would say it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I think... It's very encouraging that we have this now, and it's getting more and more accepted, and it's not generally accepted yet. We're not going everywhere and pulling out our crypto wallet to pay for everything we get. Um, but plenty of places now we're seeing more and more are accepting it, and it's becoming legal tender in some places. So I think it's very exciting, very encouraging. I, I mean, I think Rothbard would also think it's interesting, and we all do, as like an entrepreneurial innovation. I mean, it's a technology that different, you know, that, that emerged on the market like others that emerged from entrepreneurs. Think about a lot of these cryptocurrencies too is that, you know, we've been talking about the money aspect, but there's also, you know, there's the, the it's like a technology for, for remote payments and you can write contracts that are mediated by, you know, enforced through these kind of, through the blockchain and all that. So, I mean, it's not just the medium of exchange aspect. It's a whole bunch of other uh, kinds of ways that we can reduce transaction costs by using this particular approach. And I think Murray would say it's great that entrepreneurs are coming up with these innovations. We'll see, you know, can we predict whether the market will eventually embrace them or not? No. We, you know, but it's something we would certainly want to analyze. I think, I agree. He would be excited about it. <laughs> I have another question for um, Peter Klein, and okay. uh, I thought it was interesting that in your talk earlier today you uh, brought up the promoter, that Mises' idea of the promoter, and how it was the real driving force of the market, even though he didn't think it was um, a praxeologically different like category from the uncertainty bearing function. But there was a recent paper in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics that took up this topic in particular and uh, basically said that they, the author thought that there um, could be a, a categorical distinction, basically. And the idea was that uh, the normal, just uncertainty bearing entrepreneurs are the ones who um, undertake uh, or bear uncertainty within the current extent of specialization in the market. And the promoter entrepreneurs uh, undertake or bear uncertainty outside the extent of the market by creating new production processes uh, and extending specialization, basically adding new steps, making more roundabout processes. I just wanted to know what you thought of that thesis. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't recall the exact details of that specific argument, but if the question is, you know, can we think of different ways to characterize 
different types of entrepreneurs, right? So within the general category of uncertainty bearing agents, there are a lot of different ways you could do it. I mean, so uh, there are entrepreneurs whose, you know, wh- where the thing that they do is not coming up with a different good or service to produce, but rather a different way to organize production throughout the entire economy, or maybe they come up with a new kind of a business model or a new way to organize a particular sector of the economy. You know, maybe there's some who specialize in, you know, uh, uh, making available goods and services that were never available before. There are others who specialize in coming up with better ways that we can produce existing goods and services. I think all those distinctions are potentially useful. I mean, are they praxeologically distinct? I don't know. I mean, I guess I have to think about that a little bit more. Really, the point was just Mises wanted to argue that... Um, remember, what what Mises, Mises' point there was was really, it, it's kind of similar to the first question, it was really just a communications issue. Mises was saying, if you read what economists have said about entrepreneurship, they're inconsistent. Sometimes they mean the purely formal notion of what the, you know, of the entrepreneurial function. Sometimes they mean specific historical figures who really had a big, an outsized impact. And Mises is just saying, instead of using the same word for both, Let's come up with different words. Let's reserve the word entrepreneur for the first category, and let's use a word like promoter for the second category. I mean, and it didn't—it didn't work. I mean, it didn't take off. Now, now the word is used in even more confusing ways than before. But that was really all Mises was doing—is trying to improve the communication uh, of entrepreneurial ideas, rather than arguing praxeologically where you could draw different lines and so forth. I have a question for uh, Dr. Jeff. So on our uh, on one of the slides you brought up, there was uh, three different views about how value is created. Now, you know what I'm talking about with where you showed Marshall's view and the classical view as well. Um, I agree that consumers consenting to the price at hand will create the value of that good or service. But when I looked at Marshall's view on it, I thought, well, that kind of makes sense because that reminds me of consumer surplus and producer surplus. Like a consumer has a place where they will not go above that they want to buy for, and a producer has a place that they will not go lower to what they want to sell for, right? So I feel that the producer has some sort of, I guess, negotiation like control within the development of the value for a good or service because they're, they're obviously not going to go lower than a point, and the, they're kind of meeting in a happy medium where they're both seeing a surplus from where they don't want to go to. You know what I mean? So, so you're saying that businesses never suffer losses? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that. I, I mean, okay, they well, absolutely how, do. How, how, why do they accept a price then at a, at a loss below their cost? That, that's true. That's true. I mean, yeah, they, see, that's, I would say they accept it because they have to make their product better and then eventually get to a profit <laughs> margin and go through the process of ma- making their business. But would you not say that producers have some sort of negotiating tactic in when they create value, or do they just fold to the consumer's consent of what the price should be? Well, we didn't, of course, that's a more advanced topic to talk about negotiation, yeah. about the kind of give and take, the right. bidding and offering and so on that we didn't, we didn't try to get into. The, but the point is that once the, the point I was stressing is, once the goods produced and the cost of production have been incurred, then, then it's just a marketing question for the for the producer. For the entrepreneur, it's just a question of negotiating on the basis of what trying to convince the consumer to pay the price that they're asking, and he's not thinking, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to hold out to to recoup my cost of production. That well, I mean, he he can think that, but it won't do him any good. The the actual price that 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 is paid for the good will depend only upon what the consumer is willing to pay. I guess my point is that though, there is some sort of thing. Like, I'm a sales guy, and in my experience, I've had to negotiate a ton with people with, like, what price they want to meet me at. And at the end, yes, the price that they consent to is the price that it's going to get sold for. But there's still some sort of value of control that I'm using. I'm exercising a certain amount of control to get them to a price that we want as well. And I think that develops the value of the good. But, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure we're saying something different. Uh, uh, what I was emphasizing is that the, the the point to stress at a theoretical level is that cost of production, what, whatever they are, do not have an independent impact on the establishment of the price of the good that they produce. The the cause and effect structure actually goes the other way around. It it so. so Whatever whatever cost of produ- whatever it is that cost of production can do to influence the way people think about things in negotiating, it's it's just the negotiating that determines the price, and not there's it isn't independent of what the consumer values. Yeah. I have a question for Dr. Rittenauer on the division of labor. So. K through 12 education in America is really pushing college, and they have been for the last, you know, probably 10, 15 years. Um, I'm just wondering what you think in regards to uh, the lack of people going into trades when the uh, the reality of the situation is a person that's going to go be an electrician is going to be in half the debt as me and make triple the money in two years. Uh, I'm just wondering what your stance is on uh, if that will eventually have a negative impact on the entire economy with people not going into those trade jobs because of the societal, the way society looks at, uh, looks down upon people in the trades as compared to with a college degree. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I mean, ideology does matter. Um, so if you, yeah, I mean, we know ideology matters and we know that, uh, uh, you know, uh, continual communication from teachers at every grade has an impact on how people think. Um, I, I, I still think, though, that, I mean, given all that, uh, I still think that, I mean, if, if there are imbalances, if there, if there is, you know, excess demand of certain trade services, the value of those services are going to raise and people are going to pick up on it. And I, I mean, I think even now the, the, the pendulum has swung some, I mean, I think the, 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 the what do you want to call it? The, uh, the, 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 education debt bubble is, you know, is out of the bag and, and, uh, an increasing number of, uh, potential college students have recognized, well, this isn't such a great deal and are making, the, you know, voluntarily making the switch, even, you know, regardless of the relentless propaganda. So I think, I mean, as long, again, as long as we keep markets relatively free, then these things will sort themselves out and people make the decision not to be in the situation where you're, you know, miles in debt and you're, you're not earning enough money to pay for for the debt versus, you know, going the trade route. So I think it's sort of sorting itself out um, and it will sort itself out as long as the market's free. Hi, right, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, just any of you all can weigh in on this. Um, so taking a look at what we've talked about today, it's been very academic and I, I may be a minority in the room. I, I don't uh, my, my work is not in academia or any of the very specific topics we've been discussing, but more so just the, you know, the someone that's not. So uh, can you, what would you say the best way is to distill down some of the conversations that we're having to be able to explain this to someone that has no knowledge of this at all? As I, I think uh, we, someone mentioned in an earlier presentation, we'll leave this week knowing more than 99% of the you know, average American. So how do we distill down some of the very specific and technical language that you all have been using into something that helps someone be a supporter and, and uh, understand the general concepts? Um, those are the people I spend my day, day talking to. And, and uh, yeah, I'd love your all's uh, opinion on that for anybody. Thank you. The Mises Institute just recently, and Tho can tell you about it, has just started a series of short videos, like two to three minutes long, right? And it's specifically targeted for people like that. So if you think you could get them to watch a sh very short video that's totally on a very basic level, we have them, they're on, um, uh, actually, I, there may be one on money, there may be one on 
uh, what are markets? I mean, very simple. And I know we have very short attention spans now, but now we have these really, really well done. They're like a cartoon, animated and very basic and put it in plain English words. Well, I was going to say, or, or you know, you can watch them and then try to get a feel for how are these concepts explained with this terminology and then just sort of use that as a pattern. Uh, because, I mean, in some sense, that's what, it, that's what it has to take. I mean, the ideas are up here, and then, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, what, what we're doing here has also been already distilled uh, to, to, a, to a certain level, and then, you're right, to, to then try to, uh, you know, to communicate it to someone else. It, it takes a while to, to think of good, like, examples, analogies, and things that people can grab a hold of, but... Um, uh, so, you know, just spend some time. I think everybody has to do, in some sense, it's some entrepreneurial. Everybody has to do that in, given their own circumstances. And you know you're the people that you're trying to communicate with better than we do. So, Though, aren't there sessions uh, at the end of the week that address this very Yes, question? yes. We'll, we'll have some sections kind of on this topic as well as just kind of application to contemporary issues, which I think might also play, play a role there. I think we have time for one last question. Hello, so my question is for Rittenauer. Um, <laughs> I am curious, I guess, to how the division of labor works under hostile environments or hostile, somewhat hostile parties, or maybe parties that may become hostile in the future. For kind of an example, let's say the US and China maybe at some point. And let's say China has a comparative advantage in developing certain like computer technologies, while the U.S. has a comparative advantage in, advantage in producing corn because we subsidize it so much. Um, so, what is I guess the risk and reward when it comes to like continuing with our comparative advantage of corn instead of investing more heavily into something like computer parts when possibly in the future we may not have um, such a trading partner? Yeah, you know, I think that, that's a good question. I mean, some sense, it's, a, it's an entrepreneurial question. You'd, uh, there are other considerations, uh, you know, besides, I don't know what you want to call them, purely economic. That that I mean, you can make the case that the 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 law of association holds regardless of what the geoglobal political situation is. Um, and so, uh, you know, if, if if we're if we're dealing with a world of peace and and um, and uh, have that sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, what should one say, a, a, a sense of trust that is warranted between parties, then, then it's a whole lot easier. Now, in, in, in the present world we're in, things are messy. You don't know who, you know, if you don't know who you can trust, there may, you know, there may be, there may be reasons some people might say are valid to at least make sure that we have the capability of doing what we want to do, uh, but those are again those are those extra, those are sort of like more political questions and not not as not as like it, it doesn't really affect the, um, the the economics of the case. Just to amplify that, when when I was a teenager, my least favorite chore was mowing the grass. I had all kinds of pollen allergies. I just hated it. And as an adult, I have never mowed my own grass. I mean, I go to the market, right? I utilize the division of labor and pay somebody to mow the grass. You know, there are a lot of things that you, you know, do, some of you, maybe your parents taught you how to do basic household maintenance, you know, how to change a fuse, or maybe you know how to work, change your own oil on your car. Um, look, we all make decisions. I mean, I, I know that I don't know how to grow food. Okay, if this, you know, if there's zombie apocalypse, you know, division of labor completely breaks down, I'll probably starve because I don't know how to hunt animals and skin them and, you know, and I don't know how to grow corn or whatever. But, but, but if I were like a prepper, you know, if I were some kind of person who's always thinking about how am I going to survive when the grid collapses, you probably know, maybe some of you are like this, right? I would practice... I would learn how to grow food, and I would learn how to build things out of wood and do all these other handy-dandy things, right? Now, but the point is, to, to your question, I mean, if I decided I'm going to grow my own crops in the backyard, 
I mean, I'm going to be worse off. The, the law of association tells me that I will be worse off trying to be self-sufficient in some of those things than if I relied on the market. But if you're a prepper, you say, I don't care, right? I'm willing to accept being less efficient and having less food available and a, a, a reduced variety and quality of food because I'm so worried that someday I might have to live off the land. Okay, economic theory doesn't tell you whether it's okay to have that belief or not. Whether, you know, it, we're just saying, look, if you choose to be self sufficient, the, the price that you pay is from, from not participating in the di division of labor is, yeah, here's the cost you're going to bear less food, less, hot, but worse food, whatever. So, likewise, at the national level, you can imagine a larger community that says, well, we're not good at making steel, but we're so worried that some other group is going to, you know, start a war with us that we're willing to bear that price of having a less efficient steel industry, a lower overall standard of living today, because we're so worried we don't want to be dependent on some other group for steel. Economic theory doesn't tell you if you should do that or not. That's a political question. But economic theory does tell you if you choose to not to participate in the division of labor, you'll you'll you know there's a cost associated with that. That being said, that is our panel for tonight. A round of applause. <laughs>